What's going on, guys? Had a long, long fucking day, but it's about to get spicy, man. We're back for another weekly film of Bunk Bed Breakdowns. Yours truly, an FB god himself, uh, the self-proclaimed fantasy football god. Nope, AKA nope, we're not doing Justin that. Justin Herbert Stan, uh, a.k.a. Anthony Lynn's godson. Um, anyways, you know, there's a lot of stuff that went on this weekend. Hopefully, those of you that were in the playoffs succeeded. Noah and I got our W in the BBB Listener League, put up 200 points. Suck it, everyone in there. Big dub. I forgot who we beat, but it was, it was a good w. match. I think he had – um. Who played late Monday and he put up crazy points. Oh, he had Kareem Hunt. We were up like yeah, yeah, yeah. Kareem Hunt yeah, put yeah. up like 30. I got a little we nervous. were up by like 70, so it didn't matter at that point. But he put up a good fight. It's it actually a pretty fun league, to be honest. Uh Noah, man, dude, I'm loving that sweater. Where the fuck is my sweater? What the hell? You get that one from Nick? I didn't get one. I got it from the big dog store. Big was it big dogs fantasy.com. Go to the shop. I got it Black Friday. You can get a little deal. Probably a little pricey right now, but I mean the quality it, it says nice. it all. It's a little it looks nice. It pops. It pops. It makes it makes your uh, I don't know if you call that a beard, but the pubes on your face, it makes it pop real well. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, uh, man. all right, man. Hit that intro. All right. Today, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Uh, we're, we're not going to go through every single game. I think what's more interesting now is, you know, you're in the playoffs, like, you know, you, ha- you have who you have and you're going to start what you have and ride, ride or die. Right. But we want to take a look back at our dynasty rankings and kind of look at some of the biggest movers. You know, there's been a lot of shock, you know, this season, uh, even more so than every other season because of COVID. So, you know, there's some big risers, there's some big fallers as always some big freaking misses and cold takes by yours truly. So we're going to go over all that stuff and just, you know, highlight a couple of the key players and, and big movers and what we think about them going forward, more importantly. And, you know, we talked about this uh, on the Market Watch Mondays, but you don't want to be someone that's like tinkering with your rankings like every week, every day. If people do that shit and you don't get any value from it, if you did that, you probably would have dropped freaking Jonathan Taylor to like an RB3. Uh, I don't know if Noah did that. He probably did that actually. To For sure. hundred <laughs> percent. And then now you got to move back up to an RB1. So Noah, man, who are we talking about first? All right, I want to start by saying, first off, I am not going to timestamp this video because it's about 11 p.m. and this video goes up in six hours and I'm not going to rewatch this to timestamp it. So whoever fully timestamps this video in the comments, I'll send you an invite to the Discord. If you're already in the Discord, I don't know, we can probably work something out, but I'd really appreciate if you guys did it because I know it helps you guys out. But at the same time, I also have like a final exam in eight hours. I don't want to keep complaining, but I'm just, I'm not going to do it. But We're going to start off real simple. Somebody who moved way up our rankings and it's kind of a cop out to bring up rookies. We got Justin Herbert. He's all the way up on my QB four. And as Mike said, it's not smart to always move guys up week after week. You kind of want to see how the year plays out in full. And I know Herbert's struggled as of late, but he's also played Bill Belichick who kills rookies. The bills off a buy. I know this past week against the Falcons wasn't great, but we can go on and on about how Anthony Lynn just does not want this team to win. He does not want Justin Herbert to develop, but I think, what he brings to the table for fantasy is rushing upside, which he showed a little bit more early on than he has as of late, but he also picks up chunk yardage with his arm. And the fact that they're going to be a top five pick means in the second round, they have a really good shot at adding a weapon. Cause I think in the first three, they're going to add defense or an offensive lineman. So I think he's in a really good spot for the future to continue producing as he has this year. And that's basically, you know, on pace to be a top five, top eight quarterback. And just like Josh Allen, if year after year, you're a top five, eight quarterback, then why wouldn't you be a top five or eight dynasty quarterback? Yeah. Uh, I also have him at QB4. Uh, you completely, you're right, man. Completely erased that freaking Bill Belichick uh, thing because, like, Bill Belichick is just undefeated against rookie quarterbacks. You cannot beat him. It can't be done unless your name is Deshaun Watson, who happens to be well, my Tua's QB. Well, Tua's up next, so we'll see what happens there. Tua's going to get fucking smoked. Tua's going to Tua's gonna wish he never freaking joined the NFL because we're going to, we're going to, Cam's going to throw for fucking less than 50 yards. We're going to get the W. Watch. It's going to happen. Probably. Uh, so, you know, the Atlanta one was a little bit, was a little bit weird. I thought he was going to be a top three quarterback for sure. But, you know, something that's been going on on Twitter, and I think it's totally true as well, is like once Eckler's came back, Eckler's going to be a lead winner no matter what. But he's like not doing the offense any favors. Oh, sorry, it's not Eckler's fault. It's the way that Anthony Lynn uses him, right? Eckler has been last year was a top five most efficient running back. No, receiver. running uh, Receiver in the league in terms of yards per outrun. So we know how he can be utilized in the game. But they're just like kind of 
putting him out there and doing dump offs and Justin Herbert is no longer pushing on the field. So they're using him like they would with Kalen Balaj. The only difference yeah. is, is like when you have Kalen Balaj, you don't force it to him. And Justin Herbert was taking shots downfield. I legit haven't seen him throw the ball like yeah. further than 20 yards downfield outside of the Hail Mary passes against the Bills, which he completed two of two. So I mean, yeah. I can do it. You're just not using him that way. Mike Williams also dies every time he plays football. So that doesn't really help him. But <laughs> I think if they add somebody like Jalen Waddle, maybe his injury pushes him down the draft board. They get him in the early second round. I know last year they trade up to the late first to get Kenneth Murray, so maybe they want to make the same move. Uh, if somebody is valuable on the board there, maybe at pick whatever they are, five, six, they get Jamar Chase, somebody who can stretch the field as well. Like If they add a weapon there, it's just wheels up. And even if they don't, the arsenal that he has in a yeah. full offseason as the number one, which he wasn't practicing as this offseason, I think quarterback you know, five, six, seven around that range is basically his floor. They just they just got to get rid of Anthony Lynn. That's I mean that's the bottom line is Anthony Mike, Lynn. You're great, you're preaching to the choir. There is nobody who wants him gone more than me. Great dude, uh, great community man. Uh, probably is still a really good defensive coordinator, just not a good head coach. You just can't. It's like have Todd him. Bowles. You saw what happened when he went yeah. to Tampa Bay. He was like yeah, really exactly. good at running a defense as a team as a whole. Yeah. Doesn't he work belo- out. Hard. He belongs out on the coaching squad, but he does not belong on the head coach of any team. He just he just does not belong there. Um, but yeah, Justin Herbert, man, talk about big whiffs. I whiffed hard on him. You whiffed hard on him but you actually came around just to i guess troll us uh but i whipped hard on justin herbert and i i think i let i let his like last year in college kind of cloud my judgment too much because he was an early producer all those signs were there draft capital was there he was super athletic he has the arm talent i just did not see him do anything under pressure and you know what it turns out is like his freaking coach in college was ass and the talent around him was awful uh, and I just didn't really take that into account. So lessons learned for me uh, going forward. I'm definitely going to be you know, paying more attention to that. Luckily, don't have that problem this year with Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields, who are both extremely athletic. I think, you know, Ray brought this up on the pod on Monday, but I think that Trevor Lawrence and Justin Herbert might test out like pretty similarly because Justin Herbert blew up the combine. You know, he mm-hmm. went out there and like ran, ran pretty damn nice. And that's the other thing. He's not really running as much anymore um yeah he's gotten hit low a ton yeah, the offensive he, line isn't helping him. i'm pretty sure the one thing anthony lynn may have done right this year is tell him to not go out and yeah. sacrifice his body and run so there's yeah. one positive there but on the flip side it kind of hurts you for fantasy that he's not scrambling when maybe he should sometimes yeah exactly so that's justin herbert big mover at quarterback um, i think if you guys we were right on though and for fallers at least me uh, i hated drew lock this offseason i thought yeah. he was terrible and he's my quarterback 25 and that's probably too high like once you get past quarterback 20 i'm like what's the point of even like finagling these guys rankings i'm just gonna put you really low the issue i have with drew lock is like he was never really picked to be their franchise quarterback like he was an early second round pick i believe and at that point it's like okay it's an upside shot you get one year maybe two to prove if you can do it i know he blew up last week he had a few huge huge games he does against terrible defenses I just, I don't see it there. People wanted to put him in top 15 just because he had the weapons. And sure, he has the weapons this year as well. I mean, we saw what Cajun Hamler can do. We saw Jerry Judy produce. We've seen Tim Patrick and Noah Fant healthy. He's, to me, he's just not it. Maybe he gets one more year there, but I wouldn't be surprised if in a quarterback heavy draft, uh, they want to go get a six foot five white quarterback with a big arm because John Elway, his mouth's going to water when he sees like Mac Jones or, you know, Kyle Trask doesn't have the biggest arm, but I'm sure you can see him through rose colored glasses and try to pick him at like 15th or 16th. Yeah, I mean, Drew Luck stinks. There's no no way around it. Um, I'm kidding. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't stink. But he's just no, he not does. a. Yeah, actually, no. He, he does stink. Uh, <laughs> you know who else speak- stinks? Is Carson freaking Wentz, dude. Oh my he god, is- I was so wrong about Carson. I thought this was gonna be a good year for him, man. I thought they were gonna Jalen Rager is gonna be good there. Who has also been really really bad, to be quite frank with you. I mean, Carson Wentz has been bad, but but Jalen Rager has also been pretty bad. But I thought Jalen Rager would, would unlock him. I thought they should have added Brashad Perriman as a weapon. But you know, the offensive line injuries. Call it what you want. Like everyone makes makes all the excuses. He has no talent, whatever. This guy cannot even hit a dump off to Miles Sanders. Watching him try and do a screen to Miles Sanders was like was pulling teeth, man. It was it was just a brutal. Like I've never seen someone regress this hard. I remember looking back and maybe week six or seven, maybe I don't know when it was because Miles Sanders got hurt, but I was looking at his season long pace. He was on pace for like 95 targets and like 43 catches. I'm like, how is this possible? <laughs> and then you watch it. Miles Sanders has dropped a lot of passes, but Carson Wentz throws the ball, gets hit in his arm, and it goes 40 feet in the air. They intercept at pick six almost every time. He was Jameis Winston without the passing touchdowns and passing yards this season. He was basically a glorified running back because all his fantasy value was coming by way of rushing touchdowns. So 
he was a, a complete whiff. I'd say not to call you out, but I know you were huge on him this offseason. We had those debates between Carson Wentz and Josh Allen. I was in favor of Allen, but I think I had them back to back at like eight and nine. For me, Carson Wentz is somebody who I do think he's going to eventually start. We talked about him on the narrative last week. I think he'll start in the next few years at some other franchise that they want to take on that big contract. But as it looks right now, it's it's really bleak. Ever since he suffered that knee injury, he just he hasn't looked like the same guy. And his rushing upside, I know this year he you know, found his way into the end zone a few times, but he can't scramble as well as he used to. He's more of an improvising quarterback, kind of like what we're seeing out of Baker right now. And yep. he's just, I don't know. I know Brett Coleman did a video on him and his footwork is all messed up and he has absolutely zero confidence. But if we're talking about somebody with confidence and I think I'm going to talk about Aaron Rodgers, but I think he fits in a mold of guys like Aaron Rodgers and Derek Henry and even Travis Kelsey where they're older, right? Aaron Rodgers, 37, Travis Kelsey's like 31. Derek Henry's basically 50 because he's a running back. I think the thing is though, for me, Aaron Rodgers moved up to my quarterback 10. He was hovering around the quarterback 20 mark because I'm like, well, we've seen three years in a row. He hasn't been great. He's a little bit older. They didn't add any weapons. What's really going to happen here? Same with Derrick Henry. He was around running back 15 for me because we saw how elite he is, but he's a little bit older. It took them a while for him to be re-signed. And same with uh, Travis Kelsey, 31 years old. Uh, they're adding weapons. And I know he's been elite, but you see tight ends kind of fall off once they hit mid-30s. I think the thing with these guys is you shouldn't be moving them down your rankings. You should maybe be moving them up your rankings because the value that they're going to bring you this season and the next two, three years down the line. And I think with Kelsey, probably the next five or six years, because he doesn't really rely on athleticism. I think the value that they bring you in a week to week basis and a season to season basis greatly outweighs the youth of another guy like uh, Derek Henry. I have him at RB five. I think him compared to a Saquon Barkley, maybe Barkley has one or two more years, but we've seen behind that offensive line. He's not, the most efficient running back. I know he's really great with the ball in his hands, but uh, early in the season, they weren't getting the ball to him through the air. And I think Derrick Henry, you know, 1500 yards back to back seasons, double digit touchdowns. That's basically his floor for the next two or three years. And he signed for, I think four. So I think with these type of guys, even though they're older, you can probably get them at a discount, especially if they're on teams that somehow aren't in the playoffs right now. They mm -hmm. want to get off the ship because they want to rebuild. I think you can go out and get them cheap. If you're still able to trade in the playoffs and try to make that playoff push and, you know, be a playoff team for the future as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, Kelsey, dude. Uh, like, I actually had Andrews ahead of Kelsey in my dynasty ranking, so I just, I just totally underestimated. I overestimated Andrews, but also underestimated the impact Kelsey has. Kelsey has been a league winner this year in every facet of the game, and that's hard to do when you're a second round pick. Um, and I, I actually made a couple moves for him to correct for my mistakes. So I, I traded for Kelsey in two leagues, in two uh, tight end premium leagues. One is a DLF Champions League, which is a two two times PPR. So he's basically like just freaking balling out there. Mm -hmm. Um, I made those moves like mid season and now I'm like, you know, in the playoffs. So, and then in another league where I'm like, freaking, I, dude, this is, this is what tilts me. I'm like, ahead, I'm for top scoring points the entire year. And I'm like ahead of like second place by like 200 points. I'm ahead of like third place, the guy in first by like 400 points, like 400, 500 points. And I barely fucking scored in the playoffs. <laughs> really? So I'm in one league. I, I finished four and nine. I had like the fifth most points. My points against were like 1,800. The second close <laughs> was like 1,400. I'm like, this, it just wasn't it's my year at all. So brutal sometimes, man. Fantasy, man, fantasy is a fickle game. Fantasy is a fickle game. All right. So look, those are the older guys. But yeah, you definitely like, if the problem is like, if you're doing a startup, like you, you just can't take them that early. Cause like, mm -hmm. like Julio Jones, like how early are you going to take him? Because there is that risk, especially this year with all the injuries. He's I'm just, I, I haven't drafted Julio in like two years. I just don't mm -hmm. touch him in a startup because. Like, unless he's literally falling to, like, the fucking seventh round, like, I'm just not touching him. And, like, no, he never falls there because someone's always willing to pull the trigger. Like, it's all – for me, it's all about maintaining that flexibility early, sticking with young guys. So, that I, if I want to pivot to a rebuild, I can. If I want to go all in, I can. But I like having that flexibility. I mean, you saw in, like, what to do, right? Like, I just I just like having flexibility, and I'll, like, I'll pivot whenever I want. And, you know, in certain leagues, like in BBB, we thought we were going to punt, right? And what happened? Like we had all these picks, we had all these young guys, and then later on we just like added guys to like kind of get build us to that playoff playoff run, right? So that flexibility is really easy to go from like, you know, potentially punting to all in, than to go from like all in to punting. It's like you're selling a discount on one way and you're buying at a discount the other way. So yeah, just look at all the running backs this year too, like Leonard Fournette, Melvin Gordon, Stinks. David Johnson, Todd Gurley, Evan Bell. Like they all looked like really good values until they weren't really good values. Like, oh, seventh round, Melvin Gordon. Oh, I made this mistake too in the What It Do League. I went completely young. And then the seventh round, this is before Leonard Fournette got cut. I'm like, well, I mean, I don't have a running back yet and my team is pretty solid and they're young and I think I could probably compete this year. Let me get Leonard Fournette. How did that work out for me? Not well at all. I'm starting like Raheem Moster and Miles Gaskin who I picked up off waivers. 
I think the thing that's tough with Derrick Henry, and I have him as my RB5, which is pretty lofty given his age, is it's always easier in hindsight to say, oh, this is the year that they were going to fall off. Like Ezekiel Elliott. Now it's yeah. like, oh, look at him. He stinks. He can't run. He had COVID. He's in Cuba or wherever he is, just eating, coming back fat and can't run. Tony Pollard <laughs> looks better than him. I think that's going to be, you know, Derrick Henry's killed me many times. And the time that I finally jump on his bandwagon, it's probably going to be the, the dagger in my heart that ends me, me putting him at RB5. <laughs> and he's probably going to stink next year. It's always easier to look back and say, oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have had a 27-year-old running back with 5,000 career carries on his body inside my top five. But I think the thing with Derrick Henry is, like, we haven't seen him slow down. And he somehow gets better as the year progresses and as his career progresses. Um, and he wasn't used too much heavily in his early career, year one, year two with DeMarco Murray. So the fact that he hasn't slowed down and the fact that he's still a focal point of this offense and, you know, he's basically a lock for double digit, double digit touchdowns and almost one a week uh, based on these past two seasons. I have no issues pushing all my chips in the middle of the table for him. Maybe not a first round startup pick because at that price, it's, it's a little dicey betting on somebody that old and not having the flexibility, like you said, but you know, during the season, if you realize you're a competitor, maybe try to trade a Cam Akers for him because Cam Akers sure is great and he's super young, but we don't know what Sean McVay's offense has in store for him. Whereas Derrick Henry, we know he's locked into 25 to 30 touches a game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Derrick Henry, man, King Henry, shout out to him for dunking on all of us at BDG just year after year. Uh, the well, God no, animals, himself. animals been his biggest fan and he has looked great for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's true. Animal, and that is like one great call. Animal has always had. He has been a Derrick Henry truther. He's the BDGE representative of the Derrick Henry uh, fan club. So, yeah, I mean, if you're these are old guys, so you got to you got to like weigh the risk. I with these old guys, right? I will fade drafting them, but I will trade for them like in season. I think that's just like about to go because you know some guys will draft all in and get a couple busts, and the next thing you know, like they got they have to sell these guys, and that's when you kind of pounce and get them from discount. Mm-hmm. Um, enough about the old guys, man. Let's talk about you know. Obviously, a big mover this off season was was DK Metcalf. Where you do have him as your wide receiver one, a hundred percent. He's my wide receiver one. But it's getting closer day by day with Devontae Adams and Tyreek because it's the same argument, right? They're older, yeah. but they're basically the next however many years, handful of years. They're tied to great quarterbacks. They're in awesome offenses. They're basically giving you running back one floors and ceilings week after week and not running back one as in top 12, but like legitimate, the number one running back on a week to week basis. So it's very close. It's all a tier for me, but I have DK Metcalf as my wide receiver one and going into the year, I had Lockett ahead of him and he's somebody who's fallen because DK Metcalf is such a stud and he's basically taking away all the target share from Tyler Lockett because this offense has went back to what they've always been a ground and pound system and Russ is no longer cooking unless he's playing the Jets. I mean, I could cook against the Jets. They, They stink. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i think that you know the wide receiver grouping like i just think about it in tears like i don't even think about it in terms of ranks i've had tyree kills my wide receiver one since like june uh since the june of the offseason that's never moved but i have moved dk to right behind my major brown right behind dk so like back to back and i have justin jefferson and Devontae has right, right behind them like for me it just comes down to like what your team is like right if you're, if you're going for all in right now Devontae adams nobody nobody gives you a better chance to win than Devontae Adams on a week-to-week basis. He's having an absolute historic season. But, like, you know, I think Tyree Kill can kind of give you that, like, for more years, tied to Patrick Mahomes, uh, playing at elite level. So, you know, those are the guys where if you're going all in, you're trying to win now, like, that's who you want. And then you got the DK Metcalf and A.J. Browns, where, you know, these are the guys of the future. And, you know, I don't know how you're going to think about this, Noah, but, you know, once the once the new class comes in, the Jamar Chases, the Rondell Moores, these studs, like, how far behind guys like AJ Brown and DK Metcalf are they for you? Are they like a first round pick apart? Are they like, well, how would you think about like trading down? Like if someone offered you, you know, the 1.05 and with the super flex, which would get you like probably Jamar chase uh, plus like a 2022 first, like would, would that be enough for you to give up someone like a DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, J- Justin Jefferson? Mike, in my heart of hearts, I'd say yes. But when it really came down to brass tax and I see the offer on my front doorstep, it's two first for DK Metcalf. It would be very hard for me to accept. I have so much faith in DK Metcalf and AJ Brown and Justin Jefferson. And sure, these guys that are coming into this class, we think that they're going to be great. And I'm not trying to hold anything against them by saying I'm skeptical. But we've seen somebody who was the consensus 101 in Nikhil Harry. Even in Superflex Leagues, people were advocating for him to be the 101, who's also a huge follower. It's people like that, like Laquan Treadwell, like Josh Doxson. It always sticks in the back of your mind, like, what if Jamar Chase is this? And he probably won't be because he's elite and he plays in the SEC and he's not a fraud that gets outproduced by uh, a former Juco player and Brandon Ayuk once he hits the NFL. But I probably, to be honest, I probably wouldn't take that deal. 
but you know what's going to happen, right? When the season goes along and Jamar Chase is putting up rookie or DK Metcalf numbers, I'll be like, maybe I should have taken next year's first and this guy who's as good as DK Metcalf for DK Metcalf. Me personally, though, I'm I'm too big of a pussy to do it, so I probably wouldn't, but I'm sure you'd be on the side of taking the two first for Metcalf. Yeah, it really depends, man. I mean, I really believe in this class, uh, but also at the same time, like DK Metcalf's just a bona fide stud, and like you don't need to sell him if you're a rebuild. You can kind of just build around him. But I love like wide receivers where I trade down, right? So whenever a wide receiver has peaked, and if you're a wide receiver one dynasty, you have peaked in terms of your value. I'm always willing to explore trade down because when it comes to like winning, they just don't really matter as much. I would say, um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from there. Um, but you know like honestly i'm I'm like you right i have dk in a couple places and it's going to take a lot it's going to take an, it's going to take more than just fair value for me to actually uh pull the trigger and like and like trade him so i think that's that's kind of the battle that we all fight with each other uh but you know speaking of like some other young wide receivers i mean brandon Ayuk. you know we we know the cd lambs we know the justin jeffersons are balling where are you looking at Brandon Ayuk? Like he's he's moved up a crap load in my rankings, um, personally. So I, I'm curious to know, like, where is he at for you right now? I think Brandon Ayuk may have had one of the craziest, like, not rises to fame, but like paths to the NFL. Because in college, when you were looking at his tape and you were just looking at Twitter clips, you're like, oh, this guy's just a deep threat. He's really fast. He's not a great route runner. Yada yada yada. Then you look into him a little bit more. It's like, oh, he's a Swiss Army knife, and he's super fast. He can win deep. He's going to be really good. Then he runs like a 4-5, and you're like, this fast guy isn't fast. And then he goes to Kyle Shanahan's offense. You're like, they just took a worse version of Debo Samuel in the first round ahead of where Debo Samuel would have went last year. And then he gets on the field. And then the guy has to deal with a hamstring strain, and he has to deal with COVID. And then he's still putting up either, I think it's 100 yards or a touchdown each of the last six games he's played in. He finally got on the field while Debo Samuel still there. Look, I'm not going to say looked better because I think they're still very different players because Ayuk is more of a downfield guy. He gets like 80 to 90 to 100 air yards a game, whereas Debo Samuel gets like negative 15. Like I get more air yards a game than Debo Samuel does. But I think the fact that he's produced with Debo Samuel on the field, let alone outproduced him. Um, I know we haven't seen with Kittle on the field and with Debo and Ayuk on the field at the same time. But to me, he just looks like a stud out there. And I think my bold take is he's probably my wide receiver three in this class. I think he'd jump Higgins for me. And it's a little bit tough to say because, you know, we've seen Higgins with a full deck produce, right? With Tyler Mm -hmm. Boyd there, with A.J. Green there, with Mm -hmm. Joe Mixon out of the backfield. He was still producing very well. The thing about Ayuk is he's so versatile. He is tied to an offense that has a great coach and a great offensive mind. And I think if they add a quarterback in the draft this year, somebody better than one of the three idiots that's been playing quarterback for San Francisco this season, the sky's the limit for him. So I do have him wide receiver 19. I do have him behind T Higgins, which goes against everything I'd say, but it's just the skepticism that maybe they do stick with Jimmy Garoppolo. And maybe when Kittle does come back, he's not as good as we think he is, or he's not going to have the big enough pie or a big enough share of the pie to produce. But that's no slight to him. I still think he is easily a top five receiver in this class. And he has the potential to be in the conversation of guys like C.D. Lamb and Justin Jefferson because, you know, over the past month or so, he's been producing almost on par with those guys. Yeah, he's been an absolute monster. I mean, he, he deserves to be, be mentioned in the same phrase. I have him as my wide receiver 17 currently. And, you know, T. Higgins is my wide receiver, like 12, I think. So, yeah, 12 to 14, somewhere around there. But that's like a big bucket of guys. I got T. Higgins. I got like Calvin Ridley, Allen, Allen Robinson. Uh, Mari Cooper has also been a baller. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, Brandon Ayuk, man, he looks, he looks great. He's just versatile. I, I think the, the reason why I think I'm more interested in him is because I think he's a little bit more versatile than what Debo offers, right? Because Debo is really just a behind the line of scrimmage, maybe like short crossing type of guy. And I, you can offer you that, but he also offers you the deep. Uh, the he's deep also pass. been very injured throughout his career. At South Carolina, he got injured. He's been banged up yeah, all yeah, season. Yeah, yeah, Debo. I don't, was his rookie year? I don't think he was injured very much in his rookie year, but it is a little bit concerning that he can't stay on the field this year. And in college, he dealt with, I think, a broken foot or a broken leg as well. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, Yuke just looks uh, – listen, I'm not a film glider. I'm going to pass that on to you in terms of what you see in there. But he looks he looks pretty smooth, man. He looks smooth out there. Like, he, he definitely looks faster than the way he tested. He looks, he looks as fast as he did in college. Uh, and once you get the ball in his hands like, – you know, Kyle Shanahan loves those types, man. And once you get the ball in his hands – He's on the move. He's getting that yak. He's just eating that shit up, and he just looks smooth, man. I do and... have one concern, though. I mean, Kyle Shanahan drafted Dante Pettis, <laughs> and he got replaced by Debo. 
Now Debo got placed by replaced by Ayuk. Do they take like Rondell Moore and just kick Ayuk <laughs> to the curve? Like, is this his new thing? Like, I think Kyle Shanahan treats wide receivers the way we want every coach to treat running backs. You just draft them so they're on cheap contract and kick them to the curve before they get too old. I think he's got it flipped in his mind where he like pays undrafted free agent running backs like Raheem Mostert, like Matt Breida, and then he he takes a cheap receiver and then throws them away even though they have the longevity. Yeah, I mean. Look, Kyle Shanahan is an enigma. You know, sometimes he's he's hella smart, and people are like this guy's a freaking genius. And then other times he does stuff, you're like, what the fuck is he doing? Uh, <laughs> and you have no idea. But the pick was right with Brandon Ayuk. He's on the field, he's scoring you points, and he's bringing you those smooth routes. Speaking of smooth, man. Speaking of smooth, I was gonna do it if you weren't. It's the holiday season, and you know. There's no greater gift than you can give your significant other than to make sure your foliage is taken care of. And nobody takes care of your foliage better than Manscaped. You know, and we talked about it. You know, we always, we never push products on you guys that we don't like, we don't use. Noah would probably use it to shave his face. Uh, no, sir. He's on his chin. <laughs> but, you know, for those of you out there that are looking for a nice little stocking stuff for, it fits perfectly. Uh, I know this because I have some stockings and I have, a manscape i tested it before this because we don't want to do fraudulent advertising but it fits real nice into the stocking and you know give it to your significant other i mean if they're if they're girls watching on this show and your dude does not take care of his balls get him a uh, get him a little signal there you know get him yeah, a little if manscaped. that's the case then sup what's up yeah a little little, little shoulder nudge be like hey maybe you should uh maybe you should take care of yourself so that uh you're not looking like freaking you know the yeti out there but yeah manscaped great product if you guys go over there, use the code BDGE as you see on Noah's sweater, and you'll get that nice 20%, 20%, right? 20% discount. Yes, sir. Uh, I wish and I knew this code and I wish I had it. Yeah, and free shipping. So don't worry about shipping. Happy holidays. Shave your balls. Nice and clean. Nice and smooth, man. Everything you want for the holidays. Make sure you get it. That was such a beautiful transition, Mike. When I heard you say the word smooth, I'm like, okay, he's either going to talk about Kenny G or he's going to talk about the ad that we got to talk about. <laughs> so I'm glad you went that way. Kenny Galladay is not on this list, but somebody who has a similar frame to Galladay that both you and I and basically everybody with two eyes, a mouth, and a Twitter account were wrong about was Chase Claypool. Oh my we God. We yeah. all thought he was going to be a tight end coming into the league. And, you know, he does his little TikTok shenanigans, and people don't want to be a fan of him because of whatever. And for, for whatever reason, Deontay Johnson can't catch. Juju Smith Schuster kind of stinks, and yet they're still playing Claypool 50% of the time. I don't care. What he showed me this year is that one, the Steelers continue to draft really good wide receivers that nobody thinks are good until they become good. And two, that he is a legit alpha receiver in this league. I remember that four touchdown game. I was out that day and I was like getting texts like, yo, who's this Claypool guy from like people in my league that don't really know anything about rookies. They're like this kid's incredible. I'm like, no chance he did anything Four touchdowns. He rushed a touchdown and then he continued to be their goal line back. And he's better than Benny Snell and James Conner on the goal line. He's, I know I've said it before. And like, I've keep, I keep saying it, he's legit. Like he can play all over the field. He's good with the ball in his hands. He wins in contested situations and watching him at Notre Dame. I think it's the same thing with Justin Herbert at Oregon. It's just, you have to take into consideration when you're scouting these guys that some of these systems just don't do anybody any favors. Notre Dame basically using him as a tight end, only running him up the seam or running like two yard crossers. He's not going to look good on tape because he's not giving given any opportunity to look good on tape, right? As opposed to a guy like at Oklahoma State where they throw the ball a hundred thousand times a game and they let you go up and moss somebody like Tylen Wallace has been doing, or you know, at Baylor they throw the ball a lot like. Sometimes, and it's hard to do because it's hard to take everything into context and say, oh, Claypool's good despite not putting up enough numbers and not being good when he's playing in college. But the fact that he's in this offense that has went from a team that relied on defense and wants to run the ball out to one that just throws 100 times a game with Big Ben, despite having no elbow or no velocity on his passes, I don't care about a quarterback change there. I think Claypool's a good enough receiver to be able to produce pass when Big Ben is gone. Hopefully it's not Mason Rudolph because that guy's a fraud. I think Josh Dobbs is, is in Jacksonville, so we don't have to worry about that. Or he may not even be in the league anymore. I think if they do get a league average or like even as Sam Darnold, they pick up Sam, Sam Darnold in the offseason, sit him behind Big Ben for one year and he comes into the fold. I don't know. I think Claypool can be a legit like top 12 wide receiver. I have him at wide receiver 20 right now just because of the concerns of what if they do bring back Juju this offseason who's a free agent. And what if they don't have a quarterback after Big Ben? But I think everything he's shown this season uh, leads me to believe that he can be a legit top 24 receiver and has the upside of a top 10 guy. 
Yeah, I've got him at like wide receiver, the mid, the low to mid wide receiver twenty, just because of how deep that that freaking bucket is. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, he someone again total whiff by me. I mean, when it comes to like analytic numbers, if like if that's like how I use as an eliminator, so I'm gonna miss on guys like this. But you know, once he kind of showed what he can do in the game, it was pretty impressive, right? I mean. Not only things like not only are they trying to use him in the passing game, like they're literally trying to get this guy the ball no matter what. Like on the goal line, like James Conner, fuck good. off for the it's bench. Like, oh, we can't throw to him. We're gonna run him on the goal line. That's how much we want to get the ball in his hands. Like that's how much the trust they had in a rookie that they picked that nobody thought was gonna be good other than them. And they've proven to us every step of the way that he is their guy. Yeah, I mean the the interesting thing is like he didn't do much to start, but then like when Deontay, especially in games where Deontay went out, he just absolutely like balled. Right. And he's getting like high, high value touches, you know, whether or not that continues with Ben, we're not sure, but what we are sure of is that he's proven that he's kind of been a good player. I will say though, on the, on the one thing that a red flag for me, for him is on the yardage perspective, he has not been that good or that efficient. When you look at it on a, on a yards per team pass attempt basis, which is like what I go do for efficiency. Those of you that don't have like yards per outrun, this is like a pretty good metric. Uh, it's free. You can just calculate it off pro football reference. And he kind of ranks behind most of the top guys in the in the rookie class. And he's be and despite that, he's performing really well, but it's because of touchdowns, right? He's like, had think, like monster, sorry to cut you monster off. Do you think that's games. because of the offense? I was looking at Juju this year. He has like 70 catches for like 600 yards. Deontay Johnson is getting 15 targets a game and turning it into like 60, 70 yards. I think not that to like write off your argument. I just think that's a function of the offense because you watch this team play and sure they take a few deep shots to Claypool every game, but it seems like every big Ben throw is a glorified handoff. It's like, just like a five yard slant. It's like, go, go do your thing because I can't do much else. So not to take away from your argument. And that's probably a valid point that he is very touchdown dependent. And that's what he's been this year. Even that fourth touchdown game, he had like 110 yards receiving. Um, I think it's just that, and maybe it's not going to change next year. Big Ben is still around. I just think it has to do with his arm strength and the fact that this offense just doesn't want to turn the ball over because they have a good enough defense that, you know, if you keep them off the field for long enough, they're going to be able to continue to stomp on the other team's offense. And then Big Ben can just continue throwing slants and putting up 30 yards a game by throwing it two yards downfield. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, look, all in all, just a fantastic wide receiver class. I think the 2019, 2020, and coming 2021 class, this is going to be the greatest three-year stretch of talent injection at the wide receiver position we've ever seen. The, the two years are already like outdone. Yeah, 2021 could stink and would still be the yeah, best three years. It would still be the best ever, but the fact that there is so much talent coming in, I, I'm like really, really excited. And again, just goes back to completely changing the wide receiver landscape and why you can keep trading down on wide receiver talent because there's more and more coming in every year in the league and they're going to produce and it's going to spread it out. And like, there's not going to be that many Devonte Adams out there anymore. There's not going to be that many Michael Thomases out there. Um, you're, what you're going to get is a lot of guys that are in that bulk, like, you know, mid to mid wide receiver one to like high wide receiver two, maybe even like bordering on wide receiver three, like this big tier of guys that's separated by like one point per game. Mm-hmm. And all you're doing is trading down and like capturing value. But like from a production standpoint, you're really not losing much. And it's really going to be exciting, uh, which is why zero RB is still going to stink because you're still going to need running backs and you're going to be able to replenish a lot. So like a lot of what we did this year in terms of like capturing the value in the middle round, we'll see where ADP comes out. And once we launch big dogs leagues, but I have a feeling that you're going to be able to do something very similar to last year where you kind of fade the wide receivers early and still get a bunch of value in the middle rounds. Oh, Mike, you um, already know Tyler Boyd is going to round eight. You know, Robert <laughs> yeah. is round nine, you know, lock it's probably round 10 for as much as I moved him down. I mean, those are all huge values and, at that point, you can probably trade like Tyler Boyd for Robert Woods in a two or something stupid like that and get so much value out of it. So, yeah, yeah I completely agree with you. Like you want to get these running backs early and sure that there's these outliers like Antonio Gibson, James Robinson, Miles Gaskin, where you can get them later. But you obviously want to secure somebody like Dalvin Cook and then be able to build up your wide receiver core. Like I know this past year, Stefan Diggs is going so late because he changed teams despite yeah. going to a team that he was going to be the alpha on. And we see him right now. He's somebody else I want to touch on just really quickly. My wide receiver nine. He is just a younger Keenan Allen. He's on pace for like 160 targets this year, not scoring a whole bunch of touchdowns, but doesn't matter when you're putting up like nine for 105 every single game. He is, he's doing everything we wanted him to do in Minnesota. There's that one year where he was extremely efficient on limited targets. And there's another year where he was inefficient on many targets. Now he kind of combined those seasons and it's just a whole new animal with Buffalo Stefan Diggs. So he's somebody that's inside my top 10 and, I didn't move him ahead of Terry McLaurin just because of the age discrepancy. And I think they bring very similar upside and floor to the table, but I'd have no problem putting him inside your like top, even five receivers. I know that's crazy to say, but 
I know he's only like 27 years old and he is with a young and very productive quarterback throwing him the ball. Yeah, that was one that was like, I was like, oh man, wide receivers changing new teams, uh, changes to uh, Josh Allen, nonetheless, who's not very accurate. And, you know, we just, honestly, we just totally underestimated the impact of Diggs. I mean, Diggs has always been a very, very good route runner, a very good contested catch guy and a very good deep ball specialist. He's been one of the best deep ball wide receivers in the game uh, since stepping on the field. And that marriage between him and Josh Allen was just like so perfect. And the way the Buffalo uses him is perfect. I mean, it's just that Buffalo, Buffalo, Miami, man, like two teams that like really just like turn their shit around and is doing it the right way. Like they're building the offense around Josh Allen. They're playing to his strengths by adding guys like Diggs, adding guys like Gabriel Davis, who we haven't even spoken of, but also a nice rookie riser there. And they're, they're just like mesh really well in terms of their skill set and what they're able to do. So yeah, Diggs, absolutely top 12 dynasty wide receiver uh, for me. I think I still had him in like as a wide receiver too. So it's not like, I, th- I thought he was trash or anything, but obviously completely disrespected him. And on your point about TDs, like that's never been an issue for Diggs. We know he can score the TDs. Uh, so I'm not worried at all. And that's just part of the variance, but we're, he's getting the targets, which is what we want to see. And he's beating the breaks off DBs, which we want to see. And he's, you know, potentially like, you know, guy that's going to really carry you in the playoffs and that you got for cheap. I made some moves for Diggs after I saw that he started doing well in Buffalo. Again, these, you know, you can make these types of mistakes as long as you don't have like take lock and just hold in your old priors, you can make moves and trade for guys. And, and, you know, maybe you pay a little bit more than you would have paid, but like I always say, man, it's better to catch that, uh, better to catch that ride, uh, jump in halfway and catch that ride, the rest of the ride up than to just miss the ride up altogether. Cause you're afraid you, you didn't get to buy a little on someone. Man, you know, that I, happened to me last year with Devontae Parker. I know it was before the season even happened. Somebody's like, I'm selling these guys for third round picks. Devontae Parker, you want them? I'm like, nope. Season starts. He's like, okay, I want a first round pick for Devontae Parker. I'm like, well, I should have given him a third. But I didn't know Devontae <laughs> Parker was going to go for 1,200 yards. Same thing this year. I didn't have any experience with it, but I'm sure some people did. Robbie Anderson, he, I know DJ Moore started to come on as of late. Uh, he missed this past week because of COVID protocols, but Robbie Anderson all season has been basically a lock for like six catches, 80 yards, and no touchdowns. <laughs> with his age and the fact that he was with Matt Rule at Temple and the fact that they paid him in the offseason and hopefully they make a quarterback upgrade because I don't think Teddy Bridgewater does that offense any favors. He's somebody that in the beginning of the season after week one, week two, somebody might have tried to outsmart themselves and be like, I'll take a mid-second for him. And then you give him a mid-second. He's probably worth a high second at this point because he's like 27 years old and he's he's basically a poor man, Stephon Diggs. He's going to catch like almost 100 passes for like 1,200 yards this year. Touchdowns aren't there, but if they add a guy like Zach Wilson or Mac Jones or whoever they want in the draft, somebody who's better than Teddy Bridgewater, who wears two gloves and can't throw the ball more than 10 yards downfield, I think even him rising to like a top 30 receiver, that could be his floor going forward because we've seen what he's done despite, you know, two other really good receivers and obviously McCaffrey's going to take some targets as well. But Mike Davis is being targeted heavily in the early part of the season as well, and he was still producing. So that's another riser I have. And sticking on the theme of late breakouts, Corey Davis has been incredible this season and they didn't pick up his fifth year option, which means they're either going to have to dole out the bag with their, you know, head down, like, damn, I should have, I should have taken the fifth year option and paid you a little bit less, but uh, either that, or he's going to be walking in free agency and going to hopefully a better situation. I know Tennessee is a pretty good situation for him because he gets to be the one B in an efficient offense. But if he goes to a team where he can be a one B in a more pass friendly offense like green Bay, uh, maybe even with Deshaun Watson there, aside on the other side from a Brandon Cooks. I think we talked about it last week, but he's somebody at my wide receiver 37 I could see moving up depending on where he goes this offseason. Yeah. Would you pay a second round pick for Corey Davis? I did. Yeah. I paid a late second last year, and I probably still pay that price right now because he's only 26 years old. Yeah. I think, you know, like you nailed it on the head, but he has to be a two. Uh, he, uh, he's not a one, in my opinion. I mean, He's kind of had that shot for, you know, three years and just proved nothing. And AJ Brown stepped in in that one role and he unlocked Corey Davis, you know, great spot would be, you know, Packers. I mean, he's, he's better than Mar- Marcus Valdez Scantling and he's better than, uh, friggin uh, Alan Lazard. And, and I was going to say Geronimo there. Allison. I'm like, I don't think he's there anymore. Yeah, He's not there anymore. Uh, I don't even know where that guy is anymore, but yeah, Corey Davis would be a good fit there. I think he'd be, you know, a good fit on and any team that really needed a second round, a second like wide receiver to kind of just like fill it out. I think he'd be good on even even like the Jets, you know, uh, once Trevor Lawrence gets there, 
just add another weapon and there are some actually like, text me he said that uh there was like rumors of him going to the jets i think him and mims there would be a dynamic, a dynamic yeah yeah him mims perriman that's a decent 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 trio i know perriman's on the one-year deal so he might be gone so maybe perriman goes out and then Corey davis goes in and him and denzel mims and gets developed with a young trevor lawrence would be a pretty exciting duo there so there's a lot of options for him to go i mean there's a lot of teams that need a number two I mean, even even like Kansas City, man, they actually need a can- number two. You know, everyone thinks that McCole Hardman breakout. You know, first it was they were waiting for Tyree Kill, and now they're waiting for Sam Watkins. Next thing you know, they're waiting for Demarcus Robinson to leave, and then Corey Davis can go there and just supplant them again. So I think there's a lot of good spots for him to go uh, as long as he is not the true, like, number one. Um, I think that'll be good. If he goes anywhere where he's not the true number one, that's like a decently high pass volume offense. I think he makes a pretty good dynasty buy in the offseason. Yeah, and on the complete flip side, somebody who is the number one on a low pass volume offense who I think in the offseason you and I were lower than Nick on him is Hollywood Brown. He's my wide receiver at 44, and he can move down. I know he's had, I think, three straight games with a touchdown. I know last week he scored basically the go-ahead touchdown that ended up being tied later on with Kareem Hunt. The thing with him is my, my main concern about Hollywood Brown heading into the season is, okay, what does he use most – primarily for it's deep passes and I know he can do a little bit more in the intermediate game that's what he did at Oklahoma but so did D.D. Westbrook and that guy stinks so I was looking at it from the lens of okay he's a deep threat with a quarterback who I know last year was extremely efficient on deep balls but hasn't been a great deep ball passer in a low pass volume offense where the tight end seems to be the alpha I just don't see how for, for, for fantasy football that works out and it hasn't worked out despite these last three weeks. And I know he has all these unrealized air yards. Guess what? They've been unrealized for about four months now. And I don't think just them continuing to be unrealized doesn't mean they're going to be realized. Like we all expected Leonard Fournette to score more than three touchdowns this year because that's what he did last year. Guess how many he has? Three. So I don't think like all this fake regression bullshit is true. And the same thing with Hollywood Brown. Like he hasn't done anything this season to instill any sort of confidence. And you can say, oh, he's open, but the passes aren't there. Well, guess what? They're not moving on from Lamar Jackson. So unless Lamar Jackson just all of a sudden becomes an extremely accurate passer or Hollywood Brown leaves the scene, I just don't see a way for him to be a legitimate option for you week to week. And I know it's a little bit crazy to have him wide receiver 44, and that seems extremely low. But think of it this way. Outside of weeks one and two this year where he was a plug and play starter, how many weeks did you feel confident playing Marquise Brown in your starting lineup? And that offense is devoid of weapons. If they add anybody else, what are you going to say? Like, oh, he's going to get better because there's less coverage on him. There's already no coverage on him. They got defenders looking at Lamar Jackson, like two guys spying him every single play. So I just don't see a reason for him to be a top 36 receiver where a lot of people were trying to make him seem to be that high this offseason. I just don't see how he uh, improves going forward just with the skill set he has in the offense that he's in. Yeah, it's a tough one, man. I mean, I bought in on him in a few spots. And it's kind of like painful to watch, but I mean, the offense has not evolved at all, man. It's just, it's just the exact same thing. And, and, you know, maybe this is what caused the fall off for Colin Kaepernick. Luckily Lamar is a much better talent, both with his legs, um, especially with his legs, but I think he can kind of overcome that. But yeah, that, I mean, you know, everyone talked about why he didn't get a head coaching job. Like maybe this is it. This guy is kind of like a, uh, Greg Roman is kind of more of like a one hit wonder. He doesn't really He's like have a one like trick a pony, game. but like after he does his trick, he just dies. It's yeah. like, okay, that's it. <laughs> that's the shit. Yeah, up. exactly. He doesn't really know how to evolve. And I don't know how that how that impacts a, the you know Baltimore offense going forward. But it's definitely worrisome, man. It's a low passing volume offense already. Um, we know Lamar is not like an elite passer. He can get it done. You know, he sure can get it done, but he's not a consistently top end passer uh, that's going to hit these guys in stride and with all these deep balls. So, you know, he's going to be more of that like fringe wide receiver three, three, four. And that's kind of where we have him. And it sounds really low, but like, honestly, when you start reading the list of wide receivers, man, there's so many of them. And at some point, like some guys are going to have to go low. It's just, it's just the name of the game. So it's not like we think he stinks or like he's bad. He's a bad football player or anything like that. It's just like, look, when it comes down to opportunity and fantasy points, He's not there and unrealized air yards, they sound great, just like how you know unrealized expected fantasy points sounds great. You know, you can expect a lot of stuff. I expect to be the more letters you can throw into an acronym, it's like, okay, that one's legit. Like O E F G. I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe that does work out. Plus 37. Like he's gonna end, end up yeah. progressing, and then it means nothing in the end because football is a random game with a 16 game sample every year. Yeah, exactly. Look, I expect to be a billionaire in 50 years. That doesn't mean I'm gonna be a billionaire. And then my will probably be like a freaking if you do, you give me a cut know. though, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll give you a cut, a cut of key lime pie. No, no matter, man. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta keep it tight. Terrible. That's you don't get the, you don't get the billion dollars by giving out, giving out, uh, giving out money to, to everybody. I just need like thirty bucks to keep paying for these DraftKings buy-ins, man. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so that look, we covered a lot of wide receivers, and I think the reason why we cover it, I think that's like an interesting. Those are always interesting to talk about, and the reason why, like, we want to talk about young ones is because, like, young ones are the, so like the, the young wide receivers are the most protected assets because, you know, for most people they want to see like more than just one year of production. So they're not like a flash in the pan type thing. But for me, once I see like, like not even one full season, once I see like enough games with guys like Justin Jefferson, like I'm already jumping in because early production is the greatest indicator of future success. And we saw that even with outliers like Terry McLaurin. So in drafts next year, I think, you know, you're going to have the same type of thing where people undervalue guys like Brandon Ayuk, uh, guys like, you know, maybe even Chase Claypool, guys like T Higgins. You're going to be able to get these guys at value after trading down in those like sweet middle middle ranges and those are the guys you're going to be able to build a dynasty team around so it's going to be exciting i'm excited to see where adp shake out uh kind of as the off season starts kicking off for some of these young guys because there's always a young guy discount and i'm always there to scoop it up yeah and i think on the flip side there's also a young guy whatever an opposite of a discount is with somebody like tj hawkinson right Premium. who entering premium okay uh, not really because he moved further down so i guess he was kind of a discount he, he was a discount in this offseason because people are like okay he didn't produce as a rookie despite every narrative being like okay tight ends never produce as rookies and i'm pretty sure it was going as late as like tight end eight or nine after a guy like hayden hurst or in the same round as like hayden That's hurst good. and tyler higby who have fallen off the face of this planet and i think a point to take away like obviously we know tj hawkinson's good mike's been shouting from the rooftops to buy him in both redraft and dynasty and he's looked really good because of it because he's like a top three tight end he produces like 50 yards and a touchdown every other week i think a point to take away is this season with kyle pitts being as highly touted of a prospect as he is and i know he's more of a move tight end like a noah fantas or a darren waller is i think still what you should do, and I think you share the same sentiment, I think you talked about it with Ray on the Market Watch Monday, is just fade him in the draft to take somebody who has a higher chance of breaking out year one and then buying him at a discount in his second year. And I know as a move tight end, he probably will have more opportunities to produce, getting thrown the ball a lot instead of being out there blocking a ton. But we saw guys like Eric Ebron, who were top 10 picks in the NFL draft, not really do anything as rookies, and then you can buy them at discounts, and sometimes it doesn't really work out like an Eric Ebron. So... Uh, I know this is like talking about TJ Hawkinson being very good and being a riser, but I think on the flip side, somebody like Kyle Pitts, you might, it might end up kicking you back in the face and being like, man, maybe I should have taken this guy who is extremely athletic and awesome in college and probably going to land on a team in the top 10 that wants to use him. But I think the safer play there, and maybe you don't always want to play it safe, but I think the safer play there is not waste like the 107 pick on a guy like Kyle Pitts. Just wait for the second offseason like you could have done with a Noah Fant or TJ Hawkinson, get them a bit cheaper and then capitalize on that gained value. Yeah, just like, you know, just imagine like drafting, uh, t- like I was an early drafter at TJ Hawkins. I went all in and look, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it's worked out, but I've had to wait like two years, right? And he, you said he didn't produce his rookie year. He actually produced. I mean, that's what rookie tight ends do. Like he put up a, a pretty good rookie season for a tight end considering he got injured as well. And then now in the second year, he's, you know, you wouldn't say he's a world breaker, but this, this progression that he's on is like on track for like elite status down the road, but just takes time. Right. And, you know, you don't want to be the guy that pays for holding time. Uh, you don't want to be the guy that like holds a guy and the guys on your roster. You can't really trade them because you're not going to get full value, but you can't really start them because he's still like kind of, you know, developing. And that's just what tight ends do, man. Like very few tight ends come out the gate and just ball out. Like even Evan Ingram, he came out and put up like a 700, 800 yard season. And that was like considered like elite, elite next season. What happened? He like he like regressed, right? So it's just a really really tough learning experience for some of these guys. So you just don't want to go all in on a guy like Kyle Pitts. And I love Kyle Pitts. He's he's, he's fantastic. He's gonna be incredible. But wouldn't you rather take a shot on like you know Rondell Moore, like Jamar Chase, and hope that one of these guys turns into like T Higgins or they turn into like a Justin Jefferson or like a CD Lamb, and then you flip them later for freaking Kyle Pitts plus? And that's that's the path that you kind of want to go like down. Like right now, T Higgins has more dynasty value than Hawkinson, despite Hawkinson being higher rated at his respective position than a T Higgins is. Yeah, exactly. And Kyle and Hawkinson has like panned out in like pretty much every single way. So. It's just like a really, 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 really tricky position. And if you're not a George Kittle, Travis Kelsey, like Darren Waller, like true, true target hogs, it's really tough to kind of like take a swing on that. And it's, it's almost always better to just buy on the discount. And you don't want to buy guys that like fall completely flat on their face either, right? Like TJ Hawkinson, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but his like 400, like 500 yards, whatever it was, like that is a, that is a decent step in the right direction. What Noah Fant did also a decent step in the right direction. And then you can buy those guys later 
because people are expecting these guys to go out and put up like 800, 900 yards right away. And it's just not reality. And you can always buy them at discount later. So I'm probably not going to have any Kyle Pitts in tight end premium, especially like, I bet you he goes like top five picks, like in every single draft, someone's going to be, someone's going to be like a Kyle Pitts fan. Just take them there. And I'm going to be happy sitting at 1.08, 1.09, landing some of these wide receivers. And that's the path that you should really, really try and go down. Yeah, and you know people are going to rank Kyle Pitts over Travis Kelsey for Dynasty, and then you're going to be like, okay, Travis Kelsey put up 1,600 yards this year. Kyle Pitts put up 450 on the lines because they drafted another tight end. So, yeah, it's tough to trust a rookie tight end. And I know you said, like, TJ Hawkinson, Hawkinson showed flashes. His first game ever in the NFL was, like, 130 yards and a touchdown. Then he did nothing the rest of the year, and people completely forgot about his first ever NFL game being a legit top five guy. And because of that, he just fell off the face of the earth when he probably shouldn't have. So, yeah, with Kyle Pitts, and I know they have other guys like Pat Fryermuth, and uh, I probably botched the hell out of that name. And the guy from Miami, I think Brevin Jordan, they're probably going to be all three of them better than any tight end in this previous class. Like Cole Komet seeing seven targets a game, doing nothing with it. Uh, despite the class being stronger, that doesn't mean you have to go out and spend all your draft capital on them. You can just wait like you could have done with basically every other class and gotten them at a much bigger discount than you would have in the rookie draft. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think, you know, do you want to cover a little bit of the running backs? I mean, look, running, rookie running backs, to be honest, haven't moved much for me. Like, I didn't really panic. Like, Jonathan Taylor has kind of been a top, you know, call it six to eight pick for me the entire year. He's been my rookie running back one. He's never moved. Uh, DeAndre Swift is now up there. He moved up, obviously. You know, you're seeing these guys break out. J.K. Dobbins, Antonio Gibson, James Robinson, obviously. Cam Akers finally breaking up. Man, Dude, how happy are you, Cam Akers? Because our we were our brand was resting on that one because <laughs> we put think, everything into Cam Akers. I think his rise to fame has been more impressive than Jonathan Taylor's. Like week one, Cam Akers looked like the worst running back of all time. Like 13 rushes, 39 yards, gets hurt, and he comes back. And what was it, like 29 rushes for 170 yards? The week before, it was like nine for 80. He's yeah. looked incredible. He looks like what we were promised Joe Mixon was going to look like. And <laughs> yeah. that offense that can actually run the ball. I, I haven't moved him up too high in my rankings as of yet, but I think – it, it's kind of a cop out to say, oh, he could be the running back one in this class because I said that about like five different guys right now. But I think between Gibson, Cam Akers, Jonathan Taylor, and DeAndre Swift, those four right now, it's super hard to rank them just because one, we don't really know their if their role is solidified year to year and going forward. But all of them have so much talent. We've seen the upside of every single guy and the upside of every single one is a top five running back. Yeah, I mean, I, th this has been an outstanding class. I know people like complain about this shit all the time and I've, I try to level set like the amount of running back twos, and running backs ones produced by these rookies is actually very good and very much, you know, better than like years of past, like even like Saquon Barkley years and all that stuff. So it's an exciting class, really good wide receivers, really good running backs. It's panning out to be honestly one of the best draft classes ever in terms of the depth and the talent. And, you know, we thought that coming in, but you rarely see it play out this way. Where like, there's literally is littered with hits, like wherever you draft, like, even though I missed on Chase Claypool, I totally faded him. Even though I missed on Brandon, I totally faded him. What was I hitting? I was hitting on like T Higgins. I was hitting on like all these other wide receivers and running backs. I was hitting on Antonio Gibson. You know, that was, that was probably like, like the top 24 picks, like other than maybe Jalen Rager, Jerry Judy and Henry Ruggs, yeah. like everybody else is hit basically. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's been a fantastic class. I mean, I think Antonio Gibson's probably our greatest hit because because we had him at running back six before the combine even took place. I think I think that was the first and earliest that I ever saw him. And then we told people to draft him in the second round when his ADP was like third because everyone was scared of Washington. So if you listen to the BDG channel, hopefully you got a lot of Antonio Gibson shares and you could flip them for two first now. Easily, easily two first. Uh, Mike, I think more impressive than my Kyler Murray trade, not to pat me on the back, but... Last year, I sold out everything to win it all. I didn't win it all. I had four or three fourth round picks, and it was, I think it was like the 208, and he hadn't gone off the board yet. And I was just sending three fourths for that pick. They didn't pick Gibson. It goes on. They declined it. I kept sending until it was like the 305. I offered those three fourth round picks, and then I added on top of it. So I made a, like a more lucrative offer for a lower pick because I wanted him that bad. And I ended up getting Antonio Gibson at like the 304, 305 for three fourths and some other garbage. And I was like, <laughs> Antonio, you better work out because I just sent <laughs> a haul for the th for like a mid third round pick. And it ended up working out. And he's been really good for me. I think I ended up trading for like Antonio or Aaron Jones plus, and then he got hurt. So like in the long run, it's, I mean, it's not great for either side, but I think, you know, not to pat ourselves on the back, but Antonio Gibson was a pretty big hit for us. Clyde over to Lair, and we'll sweep that under the rug. But then again, he's on pace for like 1200 yards. So yeah, he's even still an RB too. I mean, 
If you I know when you a great class. a guy putting up 1,200 yards as a rookie, as a bust, that's when you know you've had a really, really good class. Yeah, it's been fantastic. So, uh, are there any other players you want to go over? Uh, I think that's all I, I want. I mean, Mark Andrews, but we kind of talked about the Baltimore offense as a whole, like low volume pass, and we thought he was going to be elite this year. He still plays like 60% of the snaps, and Lamar Jackson just doesn't want to consistently throw to him. So, he's going to move down my rankings from like the tight end two to my tight end seven. Yeah, yeah, he's moved down to tight end five for me. I think he's still a really good talent, but he's definitely moved down. All right, I mean, that's all we got for you guys. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed, you know, with playoffs kind of like, you know, what is it, week four, week 15 now, semifinals, uh, one more week after this. Man, the season kind of flew by, but stick with us, man. Stick with us because I'm telling you, if you play Dynasty, hopefully most of you that started playing Dynasty this year that started rocking with us, you're going to see, man, the true fun is really the off season. That's when like you're gonna see me and Noah come out with like, you know, talk about whatever we want. Like we don't have to talk about we don't have to talk about all the games that happen. We're gonna like talk about a lot of strategy. We're gonna talk about a lot of like values, a lot of trades, a lot of moves. Um, so it's gonna be pretty interesting in the off season. So if you like if you like that kind of stuff, which I hope you do, because you've been rocking with us, hit that subscribe button, smash a thumbs up, follow Noah, follow me on Twitter, uh, follow Nick too if you want. Uh, and then just, you know, engage with us, man. We're going to be on here all off season. There is no off season in dynasty. It's going to be fun. If this is your first off season preparing for your rookie drafts, man, stick with us because we're going to have a lot of stuff coming out with the draft guide and, and everything coming down the lines and be a lot of content flowing your way to kind of get you ready for those drafts. All right. That's all right. Peace. Peace.